This is Ken Woods interviewing for the Oklahoma Living Legends, and I'm visiting with Dr. Harry Dupree in uh, his home in August of 1979. Uh, we'll, uh, we're, we're talking about uh, Dr. Dupree's collection and his uh, interest in Indian artifacts, how it began, and, uh, and we will be talking individually about some of the artifacts. I'd suggest that we hold you this about two inches, something like that, from uh, your, your mouth as we talk. Uh, Dr. Dupree, I'd uh, like for you to start off by telling me at what age and how you became interested in the Indian culture and the Indian artifacts and what it was that triggered this interest. Well, we lived in the Ozarks in Missouri for a short time when I was small, and I started out collecting Indian arrowheads that I would find out in the uh, low uh, bottom pastures uh, along the creek banks and the rivers up in the Ozarks. And uh, then later when we moved to uh, Oklahoma, I would go back there and spend my summers uh, uh, when I was in high school. And uh, I continued to hunt for the arrowheads and other artifacts while I was up there. And in uh, this, I developed the uh, interest in trying to find out more about the Indians. Where we lived in Oklahoma City was west of the old Univer Epworth University campus, and uh, as little kids, we played around in there and imagined that we were Indians and cowboys, and uh, all of uh, us that played around there together had somewhat of an interest in Indians, and uh, uh, I guess mine just stayed with me a little bit longer than uh, some of the others because my interest is just as great or greater today uh, than it was uh, when uh, I uh, first developed this. Then uh, after uh, I uh, started to college, I read more about the Indian culture and about uh, their treatment at the hands of the our government and the uh, white people in general, or non-Indians in general. And uh, uh, then when I was in college and medical school, when I would have a little time off, uh, I would go out and hunt the Indians up where they were camped out and trade with them. And uh, even before Dorothy and I were married, when I would have a day off in medical school, on the weekend, we would go out and find Indians camped out and trade with them to get uh, beadwork and different artifacts that might be available to what us. Were some of the, uh, the, in Missouri, what period was it that you were hunting arrowheads in, and what tribes were involved there? Well, I, I'm not sure just exactly what tribes, except that uh, they were apparently uh, the same group of people that uh, lived in eastern Oklahoma. And uh, I think uh, uh, these people were uh, the ancestors of the Caddo uh, group and uh, uh, similar in many respects to those that uh, uh, developed the Spiro Mounds in eastern Oklahoma. The, uh, uh, now, uh, you mentioned your wife. She has Indian blood, isn't that what? What is her uh, Indian heritage? Dorothy is... Uh, uh, part Choctaw from the Lafour, Lafleur family, and she is part Chickasaw from the uh, Harris family. And when I found out that uh, she was part Indian, why well, that sensed uh, my interest in her. She had royal blood and two tribes, then, didn't she? As far as I was concerned, yes, sir. Uh, the uh, now in uh, when where did you go to college? Did you? Uh, I uh, took all my uh, uh, college work uh, for AB and BSAB in uh, Oklahoma City University and then medical school in uh, Oklahoma Medical School here in Oklahoma City. What tribes were you visiting? You mentioned you visited tribes. We visited mostly the Cheyenne, sometimes Arapaho, and uh, uh, we would occasionally uh, get down into the... Uh, Kiowa and Comanche areas uh, in uh, the southwestern part of the state, but uh, we probably visited the Cheyenne more than any other one tribe in our early visits. 
Now, were these visits up uh, up around uh, the, uh, up up around the uh, uh, Watonga, this side of Watonga? Yes, they were mostly around in the Watonga area. Sometimes up as far as Campton, and uh, sometimes we found them camped out uh, in the middle of winter. They used to do that more than they do now, and we would find them living in tents out. Uh, uh, along the uh, river in the winter time. What uh, what about the uh, they, they had the Cheyenne School? They, was it operating at the time that you were going to college, or had it closed? I don't recall having any uh, uh, knowledge of that. Now I presume you're referring to because the cantonment area. area, and I uh, I believe that had been closed at that time. What was the, yeah, of course, the cantonment uh, recently has uh, just gone to disarray and they are doing, they are now uh, uh, rebuilding. But uh, what was it like when you were in college? Was it in disarray or was the building still in shape? The building was still standing up there. The windows were broken, but, uh, and there were some uh, boarded up, uh, uh, apparently, uh, cabinets in there. Then uh, along in, uh, the early 40s, I had a friend that uh, had gone up to Cantonment one day, and he was, came back very disturbed because he found uh, that these uh, had been broken into, and the uh, records and papers were scattered all over the building. The roof, of course, uh, was gone, and they had been rained on a lot, so that uh, he didn't feel like there was much point in uh, trying to salvage the material even, but I'm sure that there's a lot of valuable material that was lost that could have been saved. Uh, these Indians that you met and visited with while you were attending uh, the university, uh, do any stand out in your mind uh, uh, in any special way that you remember? Well, uh, Minnie Black Bear, who is still alive today, she's one of the older women in the Cheyenne tribe and one of the better bead workers. And uh, her husband, uh, Paul Black Bear, I believe he was on the Cheyenne Council at one time. He's been dead for many years. And uh, uh, we would go up and visit with them quite a bit. Then another Cheyenne named uh, Joe Yellow Eyes, who has been uh, gone for some time now, but uh, he was very helpful in taking us around to meet uh, Indians and where they were camped out. Uh, Chief uh, Redbird, who uh, is uh, gone now, uh, we had uh, nice visits with him, watched his wife uh, put up their teepee and watched his wife take it down or strike it, as they called it. And uh, this was the uh, woman's job. Uh, Redbird, I believe uh, it was his father who was the first Indian that was killed out at the Battle of uh, Sand Hills out uh, west of uh, El Reno and Darlington, the last fight between the Indians, I believe. The uh, now you started uh, in earnest the collecting of artifacts. Uh, you, you and you and your wife Dorothy Dupree uh, started collecting after after you were began your practice. Uh, could you tell me how this began and uh, some of the things that happened in your collecting experience? Well, uh, we, uh, I, since I had an interest in the Indians, uh, they, uh, it was, was interesting to me that uh, uh, I had many of them as patients, and uh, they were always uh, good patients. Of course, uh, they were not uh, wealthy patients, but uh, they were good patients, and some of the artifacts that we have uh, were brought in to us uh, uh, by Indians. Some I bought from the Indians, and some a few of the things were gifts from some of the Indians. I made it a practice of never trying to chisel or whittle the price down that they wanted for something if... Uh, I couldn't uh, pay it, and sometimes I couldn't because we had a growing family. Uh, I would just tell them that and often try and send them to someone who I thought might purchase it for the price that they wanted because I realized that uh, uh, their prices and their uh, 
requests for these things were not exorbitant and that eventually these were going to be priceless artifacts. The, uh, what among your artifacts would uh, would you say were the most uh, fascinating of the things you have collected? Well, <clears throat> being an obstetrician, I've uh, naturally developed an interest in babies and uh, we have uh, uh, made quite an effort to collect uh, uh, Indian cradles or carriers or baby boards, whatever uh, term might be applied to them. Uh, each tribe had its own individual name for uh, these carriers, but uh, uh, they're generally called cradles or carriers or baby boards. And I think those would be my uh, probably my greatest interest. I think at this point we will turn on the projector and uh, I think that uh, in, for the most part we'll go with without uh, questions other than you relating what it is and if any stories uh, come out as a result of it, any people involved, any, uh, any interesting anecdotes regarding the item, just go ahead and tell it and then let me know when we want to move on. You might also let me know because uh, where, where I should reverse it, you might uh, suggest we will give them a number as we go along. You, uh, we may later. I may later renumber them, but for this purpose and of identification, we'll say this is number one, and then you might say it, it should be reversed, and that will let me know. And then, then go ahead and talk about what it is, and in, in any type of description that you want. You may not want to repeat where you have the same description on one that follows another. All of that description, yeah. except to point out the differences, since you've already. A, Establish certain things. You might say this is different from that pre from num from that previous one by such and such, and all. But I'm particularly interested in the stories and the background, where they came from, how you got them, and some of the people maybe who were involved in your getting those artifacts. <coughs> this uh, particular piece is uh, one of a pair. The um, other is not just exactly like it, but the beadwork in general is uh, very similar. This is one of a pair of uh, Kiowa dancing aprons. Uh, in this picture, it is upside down, and uh, at the lower portion, you can see three little brown pieces, which would be to run a string or a belt around through, and uh, the Indian would wear a breech cloth or some... Uh, shorts of some kind underneath this and then one of these would go on the front and one in the back. These uh, uh, are particularly fine beadwork. Uh, the style of the beadwork is uh, rather typical of uh, uh, Kawa art and uh, it uh, is very nice beadwork. The beads, uh, uh, as you can see, the reflection uh, show that uh, some of them are cut beads and uh, they do reflect the light. They're a little smaller than the average china bead and uh, this is uh, a particularly fine piece of beadwork because of the fact the beads are on so tight and uh, these are uh, sewed with uh, thread. The Indians learned to use thread at a very early period although much of uh, their finest beadwork the beads were sewed with the uh, sinew, which was a covering of a muscle that uh, was taken from the back of a deer or a buffalo in the early days. They'd dry it and strip it out, and then they could have a piece any size they wanted to sew with. But uh, on this particular piece, the sewing was done with uh, thread, and uh, you can see the uh, fine design, the fine... Uh, markings uh, that uh, they adhered to. The Kiowas uh, were among the better bead workers, and many of them still are. This is a, an old buffalo hide uh, uh, carrying bag. Sometimes they were called teepee bags, could be called a saddle bag. <clears throat> this is also one of a pair that uh, I got from Zach Miller of the 101 Ranch, and uh, the other one is identical. The uh, leather in this is, of course, native Indian tanned, and uh, 
since it was from a buffalo, it's uh, a little uh, heavier than the average uh, deer or elk hide would be. The uh, beads on this piece are sewed with sinew. They're on strips of leather, and then the strips were sewed to the bag. And uh, uh, considerable uh, material could be stored in one of these bags, and they could use them when they were traveling or to uh, store uh, paraphernalia on the inside of a teepee. <clears throat> this is a pair of uh, Sioux squaw leggings that I also got from Zach Miller. The uh, beaded part uh, went to the bottom and uh, would hang over the top of the moccasins, and uh, the upper part uh, went up just below the knee. They would uh, uh, tie a string or some type of a preparation to make a garter, and uh, then uh, uh, turn the top down over this. Their dress would come down uh, probably uh, to the mid portion of the uh, the little panel of beadwork going up from the main body of beadwork on each side. This is also very fine beadwork and uh, was uh, done probably shortly after the turn of the century. Uh, you can note a little bit of uh, gold or yellow in this, which was quite characteristic of Sioux beadwork. They uh, uh, used... Uh, some of that in a great deal of their finest uh, uh, work. <clears throat> Just uh, before World War II, Dorothy and I made a trip out through uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and we uh, bought uh, uh, Navajo blankets, saddle blankets in particular. We went out on the reservations and got them from the trading posts that were out quite a ways. Then we went north to uh, uh, Wyoming to the Wind River Agency, and we did some trading up there, trading Navajo blankets for uh, Shoshone beadwork. The Wind River Agency is uh, uh, the uh, headquarters for the Shoshone. Sacajawa or Sacajawea, the Shoshone girl, who was the girl guide for the Lewis and Clark expedition back in uh, 1804 and 1805. And uh, her name is held in considerable reverence among the uh, Shoshone, uh, as is Chief Washakie, who is also buried up at uh, the Wind River Agency. A little later, we'll show some of the things that we got there. But after we left there, we went on to Pine Ridge uh, the, in uh, South Dakota. Uh, up uh, near Wounded Knee, we had a letter from a man who had uh, handled the Indians for Buffalo Bill Circus and Pawnee Bills and uh, also Miller Brothers 101 Ranch Show. And this uh, man was a judge in the Indian Tribal Court. We went into the courthouse. We were the only non-Indians we saw all day there. And... Uh, uh, our letter was taken to the uh, judge, and he read it and promptly called another Indian, says, you sit, and uh, had the other Indian finish the case. He came out and spent the entire day taking us around, introducing us to uh, old Indians who were children at the time of the Custer fight at the uh, Little Bighorn, and we had the opportunity of visiting with some of these old people who were seven, eight, and ten years old at that time. But uh, we also uh, uh, got some moccasins and some little beadwork from these people. And uh, this is a pair of old Sioux moccasins from uh, uh, Pine Ridge that uh, uh, have uh, uh, porcupine quill work uh, embroidery on them. Uh, the Indians were using porcupine quill to decorate their clothing when they were first uh, contacted by the white people uh, in eastern United States, and they dyed them with uh, native dyes that they were able to get from plants, minerals, and animal uh, secretions. And uh, later they learned to uh, use the aniline dyes. Now, these moccasins have the strips across them of uh, porcupine quill work, and around the edges and the back are... Uh, uh, borders of uh, uh, 
well done beadwork, but this is a very fine pair of uh, moccasins for anybody's collection today. <clears throat> this is a little pair of moccasins that we got at that same time up at Pine Ridge. These are uh, for probably a girl, uh, eight or ten years of age. This uh, design on these is uh, by thread, and it, uh, there's no beadwork here, and uh, it's almost like uh, petty point in uh, workmanship because the uh, uh, design is intricate and uh, their workmanship was so fine. These are uh, deer skin, probably doe skin moccasins, and uh, the work was done uh, with needle and thread, and it's very fine embroidery work. Uh, these are, uh, we got these from uh, Sioux, and uh, there are uh, uh, some of the eastern Sioux that still lived around the uh, 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 lake regions uh, have done uh, work like this. However, we can't say authentically that they are Sioux because the Indians have traded, but we got them from Sioux. This is a pair of Kiowa legging, uh, moccasins given to me by a Kiowa girl, and uh, uh, the design of them uh, shows that they are uh, for the, uh, made for the peyote ceremony with the tin spangles uh, on each side uh, and uh, fine beadwork and the uh, uh, fringe uh, tassels hanging out uh, from the back. This is a pair of Potawatomi moccasins. Now, the other moccasins that uh, were previously presented had uh, a hard sole, and uh, the tops were sewed onto them. These moccasins were uh, made out of one piece of uh, leather and uh, folded uh, and uh, sewed after it was cut so that uh, uh, they're made quite different. The Potawatomi originally... Uh, were more of a forest-type uh, Indian, and the forest-type Indians uh, were more likely to use uh, the soft-soled moccasins than the hard sole that the Plains Indians used. This is a pair of Cheyenne moccasins, a very fine uh, example of uh, the finest Cheyenne beadwork. These uh, moccasins, uh, although they look uh, new uh, would uh, probably date back to uh, the uh, late 20s or early 30s, but uh, they are fully beaded, and uh, uh, this would be uh, probably two weeks' work for a good bead worker to do a pair like this uh, at the present time. This is another little pair of uh, uh, moccasins. The tribe is not uh, uh, definite, but you can see the uh, bird uh, example on these. Uh, and uh, I've been told by some Indians that they thought they were Arapaho and uh, others that they felt that they were uh, Cheyenne. But the Cheyenne and Arapaho have uh, lived together uh, in, since they've been down in uh, the... Uh, uh, Oklahoma Territory uh, uh, since the early 70s. And uh, uh, these, uh, of course, one of the prominent uh, uh, Indians up in that area was named Little Raven, and he was a Arapaho, and so uh, this could be uh, from their tribe. This is a pair of... Uh, uh, child's moccasins. We uh, got these out uh, on one of our trading expeditions with the Indians in the middle of winter, and uh, they are beaded on the bottom. Now, it has been often thought that uh, in, uh, moccasins that were beaded on the bottom were strictly burial moccasins, but uh, uh, this uh, is not uh, accurate. Uh, they were used for burial moccasins, but uh, uh, many of them were used for formal ceremonies of some type. They were not made for everyday use or just to walk around in. And uh, uh, this pair has uh, beads all over the bottom as well as the top and the sides. Therefore, a child probably uh, 
uh, one year old or a little less. That's right. This is Cheyenne. Uh, this uh, bag is upside down. It's uh, Sack and Fox. And uh, there will be another uh, uh, slide to show some of this. But uh, the Sack and Fox came from up uh, in the uh, Illinois region uh, originally in Indiana. And uh, they uh, were uh, uh, good fighters. They uh, were... Uh, staunch individuals, but uh, they lived in villages, they, and they were uh, not like the nomadic plains Indians that moved their camps around so much. They lived more in villages, and consequently they did uh, a great deal of this uh, type weaving. This bag is uh, probably uh, a good hundred years old and could be somewhat older because it was... Uh, uh, could have been made before the Sack and Fox were moved into uh, the uh, eastern part of Oklahoma. But it's uh, about uh, oh, 14 inches in one diameter and uh, about uh, probably uh, 10 or 11 uh, in the other. But it's a very fine example of weaving, and you can see the fine outline of the patterns that they wove on in this. This is another view of that same bag. Uh, there are uh, pictures of two looms there. Yes, this one also is uh, upside down. But uh, there are two looms there. And uh, the one on the left, the larger, has uh, uh, considerable decoration up on the handle. And you can see some of the uh, uh, beadwork that uh, was being done on this loom at the time. They... Uh, thread this thing throughout with uh, their uh, strings and uh, then uh, uh, do the beadwork back and forth crossways. And you can see that uh, that was to have been a belt probably or a blanket strip perhaps. But uh, the, the beadwork is very fine and the beads are very small. The uh, uh, smaller loom over in the right lower corner uh, also has a little bit of beadwork hanging out the back of it. I've just left these this way because that was the way I got them from the Indians and uh, uh, the, nothing will ever be done with them other than leave them this way to show how they work. But they are sack and fox and a uh, very fine example of their work. <clears throat> this is a little uh, uh, Sioux uh, bonnet uh, for a child. Uh, probably patterned after one that uh, the Indians saw some of the white babies wearing. This is porcupine quill work on this, a very fine example of porcupine quill work. And uh, the other side is equally as beautiful, but it would fit a small baby uh, six months old or younger. But this we got on our trip up to Pine Ridge. Here's another... Uh, a uh, little hood that is not uh, uh, solid beaded, but it's very fine uh, porcupine quill embroidery work with the uh, ribbon applique work uh, around the edge. This is on uh, doe skin. That's uh, Sue also? Yes, this uh, is Sue, and it came from up at Pine Ridge also. Yes. Now this uh, is upside down, but it's... Uh, a uh, one of the northern tribes. I am not uh, certain which, uh, uh, but uh, it's uh, uh, called a, a possible bag. It's a term that many of the Indians use because they uh, uh, said they put everything possible in them. Uh, this is not beaded on the back side, but it is a fine example of uh, fine white china beads uh, uh, in the background with the green uh, cut beads. Uh, these uh, reflect the light very well. They have a, uh, sometimes the Indians call them uh, water beads or greasy beads because the fact that uh, they did uh, have a glistening appearance, whereas the average china bead 
uh, absorbs the light rather than reflects it. But this is a good example of uh, uh, some of the northern uh, tribes. It could be uh, uh, Blackfeet or Crow or one of those uh, northern group. This is some of the northern uh, tribes. It could be uh, uh, Blackfeet or Crow or one of those uh, northern group. This is another uh, PP bag. It's uh, an old Sioux bag. It is a combination of... Uh, of uh, beadwork and porcupine quill both. The beadwork is on the strips on the sides and you can note that uh, there is some yellow in these panels as I referred to earlier that uh, was quite frequently found in Sioux beadwork. The uh, porcupine quill work is uh, in the uh, red designs and the stripes uh, uh, throughout the main body of the bag. These bags were used to store uh, things in and uh, up, kept up off of the ground for the most part uh, in the side of a teepee. Of course, when they were traveling, moving camp, they might be tied on uh, the back of a horse or on a travis or on a saddle. But uh, this is Sue. Um, is that a is that right side up or upside down? Is that right side up or upside down? It's uh, upside down. Yeah, excuse me. This uh, is, uh, bag is also upside down. It's a Blackfeet uh, medicine bundle and uh, uh, contains uh, uh, quite a few articles that uh, uh, would seem uh, uh, very uh, odd to us in uh, the use in treatment of, uh, of uh, diseases or uh, abnormal health conditions, but uh, this is the bag used by a Blackfeet medicine man. It's uh, rawhide folded over and tied down. So It has several small animal uh, skins in it, weasels, ermine, and it has uh, some rocks of different types. It has uh, several bags of uh, Indian paint and uh, one of the outstanding features on the inside is a very fine a pair of uh, Indian braids, which uh, undoubtedly were cut from uh, uh, someone uh, who was an enemy at the time of uh, uh, war. This is an old bag uh, with date probably back uh, to the time of the 1870s, and uh, it would be pure speculation as to whose uh, uh, hair this might have been, but it was uh, an insult uh, to uh, an Indian to lose his hair, and uh, uh, an enemy might take it in an attempt to keep him from reaching the happy hunting ground. This uh, is uh, upside down. The baby won't fall out, but... Uh, it's a, a Kiowa cradle. It's uh, fully beaded. If you'll notice, the uh, uh, there is a little beaded panel at the uh, lower portion or the top of the cradle, and uh, then the uh, uh, beadwork uh, is uh, over the entire cradle. Then this uh, would uh, be about. Uh, uh, seven to eight months' work for uh, a woman that was starting out to make the cradle, either the grandmother or, or some close relative, an aunt, when uh, the uh, young woman found out that she was going to have a baby, why uh, it was the responsibility of the close members to get to work uh, making a cradle for her. This is from the Pulaw family. The Pulaws are one of the outstanding uh, Kiowa families have been for many, many years. At the Fort Sill uh, Museum, there is one section uh, that is uh, uh, designated off as a Pulaw section. And uh, uh, they have been very fine people in the past and 
are still that way and looked upon as leaders among the Kiowa people today. This shows some of the beadwork a little closer so that the, the fine design of the beadwork can be seen. This uh, is uh, just another closer view of the upper portion of the cradle. Here it is uh, sideways. This little panel up at the top uh, uh, is present on almost all uh, fine Kiowa cradles. And uh, this, uh, their beadwork, of course, is different from the Cheyenne, but uh, uh, the Cheyenne cradles did not have that panel up on the top, and uh, neither did the Comanche, who were so closely related with the Cheyenne in their living area. I mean, excuse me. Is that the same one? Yes, this is the same cradle we've been looking at. Now, this is a Comanche cradle. Uh, you could uh, have a little trouble uh, determining by the type of beadwork, but uh, the cradle is on its side. But if you'll notice the, uh, the absence of a panel up at the top of the uh, cradle, and uh, then also in the bottom of each Comanche cradle, there is a little piece of wood that makes it flat. And uh, except for what they called their night cradles, uh, when they just put the baby in one for the night, these uh, uh, Comanche cradles uh, all had this little uh, piece of wood in the bottom to make it uh, firm. At uh, uh, Medicine Park, I mean uh, Craterville Park that used to be down uh, near Lawton, uh, was run by the Rush family many years. Mrs. Rush told me one time that she used to see the Comanche girls come in uh, to their skating rink. They'd have their babies in one of these cradles, and they'd hang it up on a hook on the wall while they skated. And then uh, when they got through, they'd take the skates off and go get their baby and uh, go on home. The Indian babies were good babies, and uh, they uh, had no problem with them in these cradles. This uh, cradle is also on its side. It's a Comanche cradle. Uh, has very little decoration on it. Uh, some strands of beads can be seen, but there's uh, considerable staple work up on the uh, uh, boards, or as the Indians call them, sticks, that uh, stick out at the left, which would be the top of the cradle. And on the right side, uh, it can be noted that that little uh, uh, piece of wood is uh, prominent there to show that it is straight down there. This is a very interesting cradle and, uh, to me, a very valuable cradle because it was uh, one in which uh, White Parker was carried. He was, uh, I believe, Quanah Parker's oldest son that uh, survived. And uh, White Parker uh, became a Methodist minister and uh, was more or less of an evangelistic type minister or organizer among the Indian churches in the state. He was killed... Uh, uh, 15, 20 years ago in a car accident. But uh, he used to come to our home, drive up in a white Buick, uh, uh, and uh, it was quite a contrast from uh, the mode of travel that his father uh, had in the early days, Quanah Parker, who was out leading his people around over the plains, horseback or uh, on foot. But uh, this was White Parker's cradle, and because of that, is to me, is quite a uh, prized possession. This is another picture of the same cradle upside down. This is, uh, cradle is also upside down. It's uh, a Cheyenne cradle, and uh, these... Uh, White beads are dentalium shells. They're a small ocean uh, uh, animal like any uh, uh, shellfish. And uh, the, they're approximately an inch long. This is the only cradle I've ever seen that was uh, covered with these uh, dentalium shells. They were very prized uh, trade articles among the different tribes. And the Indians from the West Coast would uh, 
get these and bring them to the gatherings where Indians were camped out and would meet uh, for uh, trading purposes and uh, would uh, trade these off. One of the Bureau of Ethnology books uh, states that a string of uh, these uh, uh, dentalium shells six feet long was worth so many beaver skins or one male slave or two male two female slaves and uh, so this uh, cradle to be covered with them is uh, quite a collector's item. What type did you say that was? That's Cheyenne. This is the same cradle uh, uh, that's on its side, but it does show the extent to which the uh, uh, dentalium shells were used to cover it uh, throughout. This uh, is a uh, sack and fox uh, cradle here. Uh, it had belonged to uh, Guy Whistler, who was the former chief of the sack and fox over in eastern uh, Oklahoma. He uh, had an eating place over uh, south of Stroud at the old sack and fox uh, uh, reservation headquarters. And uh, many people from this area used to go over to uh, uh, have... Uh, a uh, guy makes squaw bread for them. He served uh, chicken and steaks and uh, squaw bread and a salad and coffee. No beer, or no pop. And uh, uh, he uh, uh, made uh, a separate batch of squaw bread for uh, each group that came in. If there were four people, he made it for four. And if there were 15, he made it for 15. Uh, he never made it ahead. And it took him just a few minutes to make each batch, but it was certainly good and worth the uh, drive over for that. You can see this is quite different from the uh, uh, elaborate beadwork of uh, some of the other tribes. These uh, cradles, the baby was wrapped in a blanket, tied on the board. There is a footrest there, and then they would hang little strings of uh, beads or something else from the top uh, to amuse the baby while it was tied in the cradle. Did the second box generally have less uh, ornate things, or was this just happened to be one? Uh, well, they uh, did some fine beadwork. Uh, they uh, uh, did a, a, a little different type as a rule than the Plains Indians. For the most part, the Plains Indians used geometric designs, and the Indians that were thought of as forest or lake Indians used more of the plant or animal designs. And... Uh, uh, but the, uh, some of the fine beadwork that the Sack and Fox did uh, uh, very closely resembled some of the Plains work because of the design part of it. This is uh, uh, upside down, but it is a, a baby carrier. Now, it uh, is about uh, two feet uh, tall, and uh, uh, it's... Uh, Probably uh, it could be uh, Eastern Sioux, or it uh, might possibly be Cree even. But it's uh, very fine beadwork uh, on uh, leather, and uh, there, you note there are many different uh, uh, types of animal life there: a cat, uh, butterflies, bluebirds, and uh, different things. But the beadwork is one of the fine, outstanding works of. Uh, uh, the Indians, and this is all sewed on uh, uh, doe skin or buck skin. But it, it's a very beautiful piece of work, and probably a Sioux. This is strictly a woman's uh, implement. It's a piece of elk horn, and it's used as a hide scraper or fleecer. Uh, this one has a piece of uh, metal, which probably was from an old uh, wagon tire or uh, could have been from a file even, which is tied down and uh, bends up. The uh, uh, portion that they held on to was uh, the long handle of it, and uh, then the uh, uh, curved portion was the where the blade is, and that was what they used uh, to uh, scrape the... Uh, uh, fat and the uh, gristle off of a, a hide when it was uh, staked out on the ground the first side down 
and uh, this was part of their treatment in their tanning process. In the earlier days, a piece of flint was uh, tied down, at the, which would be the left side there in the upper portion in this picture, and uh, that took the place of the uh, piece of steel that's tied on on this thing. It's also noted that uh, some of these had uh, old percussion caps uh, buried in them, and uh, this one has some uh, uh, stripes uh, which are hard to see, but there are little cuts over on the left side which uh, the Indian women used as uh, records in keeping track of something. It's not known just what it was, but most of these had... Uh, some sort of a uh, 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 system of marking on them. It may have been the number of hides. It may have been something to do with the seasons, but they did have little marks of identification on them. The, this is uh, uh, dress, it's a, shows the yoke of a dress of a northern tribe, uh, uh, possibly crow uh, or blackfeet. But uh, the dress is of uh, velvet and uh, fine beadwork yoke uh, on the top with uh, uh, a row of uh, little uh, shells that were from the river, uh, no doubt, uh, around uh, the border. This uh, is an old dress, uh, and some of the finest old beadwork, of course, was done on cloth because uh, uh, cloth is something that the... Uh, traders or the early settlers could trade to the Indians for something in the way of uh, possibly uh, animal skins or uh, something else that the Indians had that were they were willing to trade. Uh, it could po probably a uh, Blackfeet, uh, but it could be one of the Indians a little farther north than that, either Yakima, Umatilla, or one of those uh, Group. Yes, it's upside down. <clears throat> this is a uh, little uh, Sioux dress for uh, probably a, a 10 to 12 year old girl. Uh, you, it's upside down, but you can notice the uh, uh, orange or yellow bead uh, on each side, which uh, uh, is again a state is typical of uh, some of the nice Sioux beadwork. This is a, a solid beaded yoke uh, front and back and uh, uh, is uh, quite a fine dress. We uh, got this uh, in uh, Taos many years ago. Uh, it was hanging uh, in uh, the store of Ralph Myers who's been dead a long time. He was an early day Taos trader and uh, also uh, one of the uh, uh, Taos artists. However, he never achieved the prominence for his artwork that uh, many of the other Taos artists did. Today, his work is sought after. This dress is upside down, too. It's <coughs> an Apache dress. We got it in uh, New Mexico a long time ago. It's a, a very good example of the use of the little steel or copper buttons. Uh, you can see the way they reflect the light with uh, fine uh, beadwork, much uh, uh, tassel work with bead, larger beads hanging from them. But uh, this is a fine example of an Apache dress. Apaches, of course, mainly in New Mexico and Arizona at the present time. There are some in Oklahoma. This uh, dress is uh, uh, upside down, too, but uh, it has a yoke of the dentalium shells. Now, uh, as I stated a while ago, the Bureau of Ethnology stated that a string six feet long, which would be approximately 72, uh, was worth uh, a certain amount in trade, and uh, this dress uh, is on fine broadcloth with ribbon applique work around the edge, and the dress contains or has 3,300 of the dentalium shells uh, on it for decoration. So you can see that uh, the uh, owner was uh, 
uh, not just the ordinary uh, run-of-the-mill Indian. It was somebody prominent in the tribes. That is Cheyenne. This is another closer view showing the dentalium work on the same Cheyenne dress. This uh, broadcloth was uh, sought after by uh, uh, many of the Indian tribes uh, because uh, they like to use it to make blankets, uh, decorate the blankets up, and also to make uh, clothing. The uh, dresses were uh, very prevalent uh, among the groups uh, that could afford to get this cloth, and it was also used to make uh, leggings out of for the uh, men and boys. D e n t a l i u m. Well, it's, I don't know the meaning. It's uh, it's just a, a little. Uh, that that's the little animal right there. Pretty much of it's a little sea uh, animal. Just. Yes, comes from the Pacific Ocean. Yes. And these Indians out there would gather these things and, as I say, bring them in to trade where the others might bring salt or might bring hides of different kinds or different uh, woods for arrows or bows or things like that. Is that the full shell? Is, is, each, one it, those, is each one of those the full shell? That's my understanding, yes, sir. Each is a full shell. This is a picture of the bottom of the dress. You can see the nice... Uh, ribbon applique work with the medallions of the dentalium uh, uh, strung around. They, they go all the way around the dress. This uh, is uh, a Navajo dress, and uh, it's upside down also uh, with uh, a uh, old Navajo concho belt around the middle and a uh, old uh, uh, Santa Domingo uh, necklace. Uh, this necklace is uh, made of uh, chunks of turquoise that were never uh, polished. They were just uh, tumbled, and uh, but not ground down at all. There's even up a pound of turquoise in this necklace and uh, uh, makes it... Uh, quite a bit of turquoise uh, today when you figure that the government has made turquoise a semi-precious stone and it's sold by the carat rather than the, the uh, chunk as a rule. But that that is Navajo. The dress is Navajo and uh, probably uh, uh, well over a hundred years old. But it's a very fine example of uh, fine, tight weaving. This is uh, another uh, view of the same dress. This is uh, another view of a uh, portion of the dress. It shows a fine example of, uh, uh, of uh, weaving design that uh, uh, they were able to do in this, and that is very tight weaving. That's the same thing. Yes, sir. This uh, is upside down. It's a, an old Osage uh, uh, cap and uh, uh, was traded to me uh, by a uh, uh, man who is half Osage. He was one of our uh, uh, state officials at one time, and this was uh, from his family. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, either ermine or uh, beaver skin, and uh, it uh, was for one of the chiefs or headmen of the tribe. This is a uh, Cheyenne uh, pipe bag. It's a, a good example of uh, uh, quill work and uh, also uh, bead work. Uh, Indians. Uh, prized their pipes very highly, and uh, to smoke the pipe was uh, something that they did with uh, ceremony uh, rather than to sit around and uh, smoke like we would a cigarette or a pipe or a cigar today. Uh, 
it was uh, a, a very meaningful thing to them. An Indian uh, never went any place without his pipe bag. He took the uh, pipe bowl off and as a rule and uh, put it in the stem and his uh, tobacco down on the inside of the bag. The bottom of the bag ends uh, with that blue beadwork uh, panel there, and uh, the portion below that is uh, uh, porcupine quill work. Now, <coughs> this would, uh, uh, I got this from Cheyennes, some Cheyennes, and, but probably was traded to them by some of the northern Cheyenne because uh, uh, we do not have porcupines in this country. They're more of a northern animal, and uh, so uh, uh, it, unless it was uh, brought down a long time ago, it was probably traded uh, uh, from some of the northern shines. However, uh, the pipe bag is old and would uh, date back to the turn of the century or a little before, probably. <coughs> this is another very fine example of uh, uh, beadwork. This uh, uh, design on the beadwork uh, uh, looks uh, more Sioux, and uh, it's a fine example of the quill work uh, below. has uh, uh, good uh, uh, edging of uh, beadwork all the way uh, up the sides. And uh, this uh, is, uh, as I say, the panel on the beadwork would indicate this to be a Sioux design. Yes, this is also a pipe bag. <clears throat> uh, this is upside down. It's a, a utility bag. It's made from the uh, skin on the feet of uh, an elk. And uh, I got this from some Indians one time that uh, uh, when they decided to trade it, uh, they uh, took some of the old family papers out of the bag, and it's lined with uh, cloth. <clears throat> and uh, is uh, uh, one of the rarer objects occasionally you see them. This is a, from uh, some Ara an Arapaho family that uh, I've known for some time here, and it's a very fine piece of, uh, of uh, leather work and uh, very sturdy. <clears throat> now, this is a pair of Shoshone uh, gauntlets, uh, we got these uh, in our, our trading trip that I spoke of earlier uh, up at the Wind River Agency trading Navajo blankets for uh, Shoshone beadwork. The Shoshones in general were spoken of as plateau or high forest Indians. And uh, this is a, a good example of their work. It was interesting that uh, there are still... Uh, uh, some Arapaho living up north, and uh, the year we happened to be up there, the uh, uh, Shoshone had received a payment for the, from the government for some land the northern Arapaho were living on, and they had bought lots of ponies, and uh, they had not been able to get uh, their riding gear and so forth yet, and uh, so they were glad to have a chance to trade some of their beadwork for some uh, Navajo blankets. And uh, we happened along just at the right time. <clears throat> Sir? Yes. This uh, is upside down. Now, this is a Shoshone uh, vest, and that's about as pretty an example, I think, of uh, beadwork as uh, you'll see. Beautiful blue bead background with uh, butterflies above and uh, then uh, yellow flowers with... Uh, beautiful beadwork of the leaves and the stems. You can see an MC on this vest. Uh, the boy's name was Marshall Coando, for whom it was made, and uh, he had uh, grown up, and uh, uh, it was made for him when he was a, a teenager, and so he was uh, ready to part with it. But it's a very fine example of, uh, of uh, the Shoshone beadwork, and... Uh, We've had it now for, uh, uh, well, 35 years, anyhow. This is a pair of Shoshone moccasins, and uh, you can see the fine floral design uh, on these. Uh, 
as uh, well as was on uh, that pair of uh, gauntlets a while ago, too. Uh, this is a, uh, the item on the left is a, a necktie made strictly for dance or dress-up occasions, which they would tie on the front of their uh, uh, sh shirt. Uh, it's Shoshone, and we also got it on that same trip. This uh, other is a beaded belt of uh, very nice uh, beadwork and uh, would be from one of the northern tribes, and I got it on a trade one time, and uh, I cannot identify the tribe uh, uh, accurately, but it's a very fine uh, example of beadwork. It's interesting that the Indians themselves have done considerable trading around, and uh, then you get something from a certain... Uh, Indian sometime, and you might assume that it was his tribe when examining it closely, uh, you uh, find that, uh, can tell that it was not his tribe, but a piece that he had traded for. These are a pair of Cheyenne uh, uh, sleeve uh, garters uh, for just decoration uh, when they would be dancing, the little uh, braided uh, Yarn on each side was used to tie them around uh, the uh, upper arm. Upper arm. Upper arm. Upper arm. Arm. Upper arm. Upper arm. Upper arm. Each side was used to tie them around uh, the uh, upper arm. This is a uh, human vertebra, probably the lowest or uh, seventh uh, cervical vertebra, and it has a, an Indian flint air point sticking in it. Uh, this uh, is... Uh, turned so that it looks like it was on the right side, but actually, uh, uh, in the proper perspective, the uh, arrowhead went in on the left, and it went in just at the right angle to uh, uh, penetrate the uh, uh, jugular vein or carotid artery so that uh, uh, the uh, individual who this originally belonged to didn't last long after that arrowhead penetrated him. Uh, I had a a friend that uh, was out in Cheyenne, Oklahoma one day, and he was doing some trading and talking with uh, a man on the street about some Indian material, and uh, this individual that owned this uh, uh, vertebra heard them talking. He says, I have something at home I bet you'd like, and he went and got it and brought it back, and it was this uh, human vertebra with the arrowhead uh, sticking in it. I have had it x-rayed, and it shows the arrowhead well stuck into the uh, vertebra. And it came from out along the uh, Washita River area, out around uh, Cheyenne, Oklahoma. Any way of knowing what it's white or Indian? The what? Any way of knowing the race of the person? No, you couldn't tell that, but it would be... This... Uh, vest here is a child's vest. It's, uh, uh, we got it from uh, some Osage Indians, and uh, when uh, I was in medical school, uh, while I was still doing hospital work, uh, I traded for this little vest, uh, and uh, it, uh, as I say, we got it from Osage, although uh, it obviously is not the type of uh, design that uh, would be typical Osage. The Osages were among the finest bead workers when they were doing their work, but after they got started
started getting their oil money in the 20s, they uh, uh, discontinued doing a lot of their fine beadwork, and, uh, uh, but they still wanted it, so they had the money, and they bought it from the Plains Indians. And uh, this looks uh, more like uh, Sioux design, and uh, I would imagine that's what it was, but uh, we got it from some Osage. Sir? You lose a lot when you get money, don't you? That's right. Yes, sir. You sure do. This is a front view of the same vest. Uh, the number on there is a number that we put on cataloging our collection at one time and then discontinued that procedure. This is a uh, uh, sack and fox uh, vest. Uh, now, uh, as I spoke earlier, the Sac and Fox were originally considered forest Indians, and uh, uh, they did more of the uh, animal or floral design, but uh, this uh, vest here uh, is uh, Sac and Fox, and uh, the Sac and Fox boy that I got it from said it had been in his family uh, uh, since uh, they were first brought to uh, Oklahoma. No, that's all beadwork. It's all beadwork. Yes, sir. This is the front view of the same vest. Now, this is a um, pipe, peace pipe. The uh, bowl is uh, a black stone, somewhat like soapstone, and uh, the uh, stem is a hard wood, and uh, then the uh, uh, design on the stem is uh, porcupine quill work. Now, porcupine quill is only about two inches long, so these had to be strung after they were dyed and then uh, wrapped around there or embroidered in that uh, design. The Indians were very good in working out uh, these designs with the porcupine quill work. And uh, this particular pipe is an Oto pipe, and the uh, Next slide will also be an Oto pipe. I had an Oto patient one time who was a very fine individual, and I asked her one time if they had any old uh, Oto uh, beadwork or uh, trinkets that they would be willing to trade or part with, and she said she didn't know that she remembered her grandmother had uh, uh, quite a bunch of old things, and she'd check into it. Well, I didn't see her again for almost two years, and then one day she and her mother walked in, and they handed me these two pipes, and uh, I said well, they were certainly beautiful, and I asked her how much uh, she wanted for them. She said, uh, oh, nothing, that uh, they were too valuable to sell, and she and her mother had decided they wanted me to have them to keep with our collection, so that was how we came to have these. This bowl is a red stone, and that's catlinite, or pipestone, uh, the, uh, that comes from Pipestone, Minnesota. The Indians have exclusive rights to that, and uh, they get it out when it isn't so hard, and they're able to carve it. Some of their pipes are very elaborate that have been carved out of that. Uh, if the, you notice the stems on these two pipes are flat, and uh, if uh, noting back the uh, paintings back in the time of George Catlin and uh, uh, some of the others uh, of uh, Carl Bodmer, some of those that painted at that time, this was the type of uh, pipe stem that uh, they uh, saw a great deal. So these pipes are both very old, probably, well, well over 100 years old, probably close to 150 years old but they are Oto. This is uh, upside down. It's a, Yavaho, a Navajo uh, uh, yay or Yevichai blanket. Uh, the figures are taken from the uh, sand paintings that the medicine man uh, drew in uh, their uh, curative or treatment ceremonies. Uh, they didn't have uh, as bright a colors as these, but uh, they did use bright colored sands, and they could... Uh, draw a line just as straight as these, and uh, their design was just as intricate. And then when the healing ceremony was over, uh, the uh, uh, picture was uh, destroyed. We uh, got this rug at 
uh, Shiprock uh, about uh, 1939 and uh, got it from uh, Bruce Bernard's trading post. The trading post is still there, but Bruce Bernard had been dead a long time. But he told us that uh, the uh, Indians were very uh, upset the first time one of these was uh, woven into a blanket and then allowed to uh, fall into the hands of a non-Indian, and there was almost uh, violence as a result of it. But today it's very commonplace for the Indians to weave these and uh, uh, put them on sale. This is a very tightly woven blanket and uh, probably should be used for a wall hanging, although we've, never, we've kept it in a trunk stored away. Some of the uh, old accounts of the uh, early soldiers writing back to their folks uh, from Arizona and New Mexico stated that these blankets were woven so tight that you could carry water in them for a short time. And this is an actual fact. They used their native dyes. They were less likely to run. This is aniline dyes, and uh, w it would not be well to uh, get it wet. But uh, in the Museum of Anthropology, when it was started out in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, they uh, got the old military records and found uh, soldiers that were stationed out in that country in the early days and contacted their families and descendants back in Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa, and Missouri, and different places, and uh, found many of their finest uh, pieces of uh, uh, Navajo weaving back there and uh, were able to make a deal to get them back for the museum. But uh, there are very fine weavers. Uh, about uh, three years ago, there was an account in uh, one of the magazines of an Indian woman trading a uh, rug uh, for a new Ford pickup truck. So that gives you an idea of the value of these. You, uh, you mentioned the use of animal secretion sometimes for dyes. Describe hell about that. Well, uh, of course, uh, the urine was used uh, to uh, get a yellow color, and uh, they mixed uh, uh, blood uh, to get certain pigments uh, that way that they would uh, use, and uh, uh, the greater part of their dye work, however, came from uh, different plants. And uh, uh, you can... Uh, uh, in some of the Arizona highways or out in Arizona, New Mexico, around different trading posts, lots of them have a chart up on the wall showing uh, different plants that the Indians get different colors from to use in their uh, uh, weaving. But, uh, the, uh, of course, the uh, animal secretions were somewhat limited. This uh, is a, a real old pot. Uh, uh, I don't know what tribe you can see uh, a little of the uh, design on it, but it uh, uh, is, uh, was obviously not made for the market, but uh, to be used. And uh, this was uh, in uh, uh, Nan Sheets' collection. She was one of the finer, uh, earlier Oklahoma artists. Uh, the one that started the uh, Oklahoma Art Center in the uh, uh, WPA days and uh, uh, saw this to the development of the art center that we have there today. But she uh, used to go to Taos every year and uh, started in the 20s and uh, painted out there and uh, collected some of this uh, old work. Uh, she used it in her art classes, having her students learn to draw it but this uh, belonged to her. Uh, this uh, is another fine piece. I uh, do not know the tribe because I'm not an authority in any sense on uh, pottery, but it uh, is from one of the uh, uh, Pueblos out uh, in uh, New Mexico. It's a very old and a very fine piece of pottery. This is an old uh, basket, uh, probably a Hopi basket, but uh, uh, it's a, a little hard to uh, say for sure, but it's very finely woven. Now this... 
Uh, I'm I'm not sure what that was, uh, uh, Pen. I this could yes, but it would be one of the pueblos. Now this uh, is a uh, uh, fan hawk feathers. Uh, the hawk is a protected species today. This is an old fan. We have not collected any of these since uh, World War II, <clears throat> but uh, the handle. Uh, has a very fine beadwork on it, very small beads. Each bead is <coughs> fastened on individually, and there is almost no Indian ceremony that can be conducted without the uh, use of feathers. And uh, when the Indians killed a bird to use for this, they did it with rever reverence and uh, not just uh, to kill a bird. And uh, they considered that in a very reverent attitude as long as uh, they uh, had uh, these uh, fans. And uh, this would be used in the uh, peyote ceremony. The Indians didn't sit around and use them to fan themselves with. They were strictly uh, for uh, ceremonial purposes or religious purposes. <clears throat> this is uh, an eagle feather fan. And uh, you can see it has a very fine uh, beadwork uh, on the handle. The feathers have been cut, almost looked like they were trimmed with a pair of pinking shears. But uh, they uh, uh, are, uh, you can see each uh, feather is trimmed with many very small feathers at uh, the base of the uh, uh, feather portion. And uh, then the uh, stem or quill of it is uh, uh, bound in uh, rawhide and fastened into the handle. Then, uh, on some of these fans, uh, on this one right up at the top, uh, on that tassel sticking up, there's a little uh, uh, insignia there. And it's interesting that uh, while this was used in the peyote ceremony, that is a religious symbol of the Catholic Church uh, in that. Uh, upper part there. <clears throat> this is a, another fine example of fan. This is a parrot feathers. Uh, wouldn't know whether these came from a zoo or uh, whether the Indians made trips into uh, Mexico in the early days to get feathers. The handle is very fine beadwork and uh, the parrot feathers are very well cared for, very well mounted there. Uh, this uh, particular fan, I believe, is a uh, Comanche, and uh, the uh, Comanches did do considerable traveling in the early days down into Mexico. Now, I don't believe you mentioned, or maybe you did, the hawk feather. The hawk feather was uh, a Pawnee. And the eagle feather, Cheyenne. Now here's uh, an example of uh, uh, other uh, uh, feathers. Uh, I think maybe that parrot is the same one that was shown. The one on the right is uh, uh, the Indians call it night bird, and uh, it uh, is a Cheyenne feather, I mean fan. And uh, the one in the uh, center is, uh, I forget which uh, tribe that is. Uh, I think those are one of the owl family, those uh, uh, feathers in that thing. This is a uh, Cheyenne uh, lady's uh, necklace. The... Uh, uh, white uh, cylinder uh, type uh, beads are about uh, six inches long in this. Then there are, <coughs> are the uh, uh, trade beads, uh, the uh, copper or brass beads, and the uh, uh, berry beads uh, used uh, throughout. The, uh, this uh, uh, type of, uh, of uh, a necklace with the beads, uh, the long uh, hair pipes, as they were called, uh, uh, go up and down on the lady's necklace, and this uh, is a uh, lady's necklace. I said this was Cheyenne, didn't I? 
and uh, uh, originally uh, when the Indians were making these they made them out of the wing bone of an eagle or a shin bone of a deer and then ground them rolled them until they got them the uh, uh, size and uh, the shape that they wanted and then later uh, the traders found out they could manufacture them uh, uh, out of bone but uh, do it much faster and they traded them to the Indians today many of these uh, dance costumes have this same type of a thing only they're plastic now, this is a man's breastplate. This is uh, Pawnee, and uh, we have uh, several things in our collection that we got from uh, uh, Pawnee Bill's brother, Al Lilly. Pawnee Bill was the one that had the Wild West show, and Al Lilly was his brother. And uh, we used to go up to the ranch and see them, and uh, we uh, did some trading with Al Lilly and got a few pieces from him. And this is uh, one of them. This is an old Kiowa uh, bow, uh, I mean, era quiver. It's on its side, and uh, the uh, uh, eras are not extremely old, uh, but uh, they are good examples of Indian craftsmanship. But this is Kiowa. This is a tip of a... Uh, Buffalo spear. Uh, it's probably made of a uh, wagon tire, and uh, the spear is about uh, oh five and a half to six feet long, and uh, uh, came from a collection of a man named Getchell. Uh, he came out here in the early days throughout the West, and he bought all of the uh, Indian material that he could get from different tribes. He labeled it where he got it, and. Uh, then it was to be stored and sold for the education of his grandchildren. And uh, at a certain time, well, for some reason, it was never it was stored and forgotten. And Zach Miller of the 101 Ranch uh, discovered it. And uh, it was in a barn up east someplace near Philadelphia. And he got it out and persuaded uh, whoever had it to allow it to be sold. And this was a uh, Sioux buffalo spear. And the Indians would ride along by the side of a buffalo and uh, with all their effort jab it into their sides right below their uh, short ribs, try to get it up into their chest. And uh, then they might just leave it until the buffalo ran on until it uh, uh, bled as much as it could stand and then dropped. And then they would go reclaim their spear and the women would come along and butcher the buffalo. This is a uh, uh, old Cheyenne pipe. The uh, uh, bowl you can see is the red stone caplanite. And uh, I forget what kind of wood this is, but uh, I mentioned an uh, Indian named Joe Yellow Eyes earlier. And uh, uh, Joe uh, did the beadwork on this uh, sli uh, pipe in uh, 1940. And uh, the pipe was much older than that. This is an example of uh, the uh, uh, pipe stone or Catlinite. It was named for George Catlin or in honor of him. And Catlinite. That's right, yes, sir. Uh, this uh, has a piece of uh, uh, lead uh, around the bowl. And uh, then the uh, stem is carved, uh, looks twisted, uh, but uh, it was uh, uh, carved that way. Uh, uh, the stone obviously was taken from a different portion of this vein or at a different time because uh, uh, the colors have changed on it. But this is fairly old pipe. I, I can't tell you the side, but probably Sue. Now this is a uh, Sioux pipe. Uh, the uh, it's made like a tomahawk. Uh, the, the bowl is uh, uh, well, the pipe is upside down, but uh, you can see the stem is uh, shaped like a gar's head, and the mouth is open with part of the stem protruding from the mouth, and uh, uh, this. 
uh, had a date on it at one time, I think it's all worn off now, of This is the conclusion of the uh, recitation on the slides by Dr. Dupree.